G'day, I'm Paul. Isuzu has updated the D-Max for the 2023 model year. It's only a subtle change, but I thought we'd revisit it anyway, because it's been a while since we've driven the mighty D-Max. Now, this is priced at just under 64,000. This is the LSU Plus, so it is one down from the top specification model. This competes with things like the Ford Ranger, Toyota Hilux, Nissan Navara. There are lots of competitors in this segment. Today we're going to do a detailed review of this car. So if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, including our little off-road section, you can use the time codes on the screen. Or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we test drive an updated Isuzu. Now let's talk about exterior design. You've got seven colors to pick from. All but white is gonna set you back 650 bucks. What has changed? It is gonna be a little bit hard to spot this, but um, there are some changes here around the grill. So the design has changed ever so slightly from uh, the previous uh, pre-updated model. So a little hard to spot there, but I do like the fact that uh, especially on the X-Train, they've actually got rid of some of this chrome and gone for that darker look. But it does have that dual stacked grille arrangement, which I think sort of still looks a little bit odd to me, but anyway, um, there are also some changes here around the uh, fog light housing as well, but it is a pretty simple update and it's, I guess, just designed to keep this a little fresh. Uh, outside of the update though, you've got that big open section down the bottom and up the top here as well. And it's all sort of pretty straightforward down the front here because they have a stack of accessories you can fit to these as well. So you don't want to interfere with any of the safety systems and the accessories can be fitted there without sort of interrupting too much of that full LED headlights. Sorry the car's so dirty. It's summer, but it's like cold and wet. So anyway, um, around the side here, one of the other changes is a new wheel design. So uh, yeah, look, it's a pretty straightforward setup. You've got a machine finish on the outside there, graphite on the inside there, and that all sits on an 18 inch alloy wheel. This is a highway terrain tire as well. So when we go do a little bit of off-roading later on, I'll be curious to see how it goes, but it does look like a pretty sort of chunky highway terrain tire. So could be worse. No wheel arch cladding. It really is quite interesting that SUVs, they just stick all this wheel arch cladding on, but then vehicles that do go off-road and need that protection don't really have anything there. So <laughs> just a fascinating setup. Up the top here, you've got chrome on the top of that wing mirror with an indicator built into there. Still no 360 camera for the D-Max, so you won't find anything under there. No puddle lamps either. Down here, you've got a set of side steps with that brushed plastic finish, and they seem fairly sturdy to me. Chrome door handles come around to the back. Around the back here, you've got a set of partial LED taillights, slightly different design here as well to previous pre-facelift uh, D-Max. So LED elements on the outside there, but unfortunately incandescent on the insides. Three litre turbo diesel is that badge. Then you've got Isuzu D-Max on this side. So three and a half ton braked towing capacity. What they've now done as well, um, integrated into the bumper here is a radar sensor that is designed for uh, two things. First is your rear cross traffic alert and also blind spot monitoring. When you do hook up a trailer and connect it into the socket here, it'll actually disable rear cross traffic alert and your blind spot monitors as well, which I think is a pretty good feature. You can retrofit this to previous versions of D-Max, but it's gonna cost you money if you're an existing customer because the actual, the hardware module itself changes with that update. So that's why they have to charge you for it. Now have a look at this, another feature that has been added, which I quite like. Hydraulics, look at that. So instead of going down the path of a torsion bar, which is what you see on a lot of dual cab utes today to make it easier to open and close the tailgate, they've actually gone down the path of hydraulics, which I think is a pretty sort of premium setup. You can option hydraulics on a lot of other dual cab utes, but the fact that this comes standard now, I think is pretty good. Only thing you need to be careful of, if you do have your tray down most of the time and you're in dusty conditions, dust will build up on those hydraulic arms. So you do need to keep those clean, otherwise they will eventually stop working. Now this is, that out of the way. An accessory roller cover, it's manually uh, actuated. You also have these accessory hoops over the top there as well. But in terms of the actual tray itself, we're talking about a load length of just under 1600 mil, 1530 mil load width with 1122 mil between the wheel arches. So it is a pretty decent setup there in terms of your spacing. And then you've got this drop-in bed liner as well with some hooks over to the side. No 12 volt outlet or any power accessories. 
uh, which is a little bit disappointing. That is pretty standard now in a lot of dual cab utes, especially the more expensive ones. So it would be nice to see that added in. But outside of that, it is a pretty straightforward setup for the D-Max. So let me know what you reckon in the comments section below about the facelift. Do you think they've done enough? Do you think that this still competes with things like uh, Hilux Ranger and the, the bigger sellers in the segment? Let me know what you reckon down in the comments section below. So we are inside the D-Max. We'll start off with the key. You've got lock, unlock, a blank, because on the top spec, you have a remote start function, a little bit of uh, brushed aluminium around there, and on the back, Isuzu. It's a proximity sensing key, so you can leave that in your pocket. Once you're inside, you have a push button start over here. I quite like that because the last sort of um, non-top spec uh, D-Max that we drive actually had a physical key to start it, so it is good to see that we've advanced to proximity sensing. Um, Look, I actually quite like the way this is all presented. I have mentioned previously in our D-Max reviews that I like that they've gone to a bit of effort here to give you that soft touch finish along the top of the dashboard. And they really have just put a bit of effort into making this look modern and presentable. There is a lot of piano black around here, which I don't love, but um, you know it is offset by a big screen and, and all the soft touch finishes around the cabin. Now, what about your touch points? So here it's nice and soft and soft on the door as well. How soft are they? Well, we've tested the main surfaces in this cabin with our gyrometer. If you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description below. Now, build quality. Yeah, look, it's not too bad. It's a little bit sort of uh, loose around there, but it's okay. And our door test. Sounds nice and solid. Now, let's talk infotainment. So, nine inch display here in the center. Look, when this came out, I thought it was a pretty decent system because it had inbuilt satellite navigation, uh, wireless Apple CarPlay, wide Android Auto. I'll show you that in a second. But um, yeah, over time with the system, it's not great and it's sort of a bit slow and laggy and yeah, it can be just a little bit clumsy to use. So I am hoping that um, Isuzu has plans to perhaps modernize this, give it a remote connectivity, which has now become a bit of a mainstream feature in dual cab utes in this segment. So... Let's hope they're working on something like that. But outside of the, the sort of standard features you see there, you've got AM and FM radio in addition to, in addition to uh, an eight speaker sound system. The sound system is okay. It's nothing sort of too crazy, no branding or anything like that on it. But it does come with live surround sound. Um, I'll show you what wireless Apple CarPlay looks like. Click that just there. See what I mean? It's like a few clicks to actually get stuff working. Um, yeah, that all sort of works okay. Nothing sort of too outrageous. And then you have a button here on the steering wheel to actuate voice commands that are sent directly to your phone there. And this is what Android Auto looks like. Crack that open. So same story there, full screen integration and then maps as well. It's actually pretty fast as well. The only difference is you need to have this connected using a physical cable instead of it being wireless. Um, ahead of the driver here as well, you have a small display there that gives you information like your trip computer and some of your off-road controls. Um, some of the other vehicles in this segment are now moving to those big displays ahead of the driver. So again, hopefully with an infotainment update, remote connectivity, Isuzu is looking at a full screen integration there. And look, some people don't really want all of that fancy tech. And let me know in the comments section below are you one of those people? Do you just want basic stuff or do you prefer that full high-tech setup of what you see in the new Ford Ranger? Now let's talk safety tech. So it is pretty loaded with safety tech, which I really like. And, and if you are driving a dual cab, you, you need to be protected, especially if you're putting your workers in it. So autonomous emergency braking, it also comes with a junction assist function. So if you try and turn across oncoming traffic, it'll prevent you from doing that. Auto dimming rear vision mirror, you have radar cruise control. Lane keeping assistant with a uh, self steering function, which we will test later on. Blind spot monitor built into the wing mirror. You have rear cross traffic alert. On the parking front, you have rear parking sensors and a reverse view camera. I'll show you what that looks like. There it is there. The quality is okay, sort of nothing too crazy. It's beeping because we've got our suitcase there. It is a little hard to see the suitcase there. Um, and the vision is a bit grainy, but um, for the most part, it's okay. And a new test that we've stuck into here as per your requests. The steering honk, here it is. Sounds okay. 
Let's talk about your practicality and we'll start off with connectivity. So you've got a 12 volt outlet just here, that is 120 watts. You have a single USB-A outlet and then an auxiliary port there. It is a 2.1 amp outlet, so you can charge your devices off that. Uh, and given you have wireless Apple CarPlay, if you are an Apple user, it means that uh, someone else can charge their phone while you have that running. Uh, in addition to that, storing your phone, where's it gonna sit? Well, you can whack it down here. There is no wireless phone charging. Can pop it in the cup holders if you want. Speaking of cup holders, do have a slight issue here. If you do have a coffee, watch this. <laughs> it disappears down there and it'll get delittered because it's it's such a deep cup holder. So uh, there is a workaround for that though. And in front of the air vents here, you actually have slots to stick drinks, including coffee, which is great. So on cold days, you can have hot air blowing on it and um, everyone is happy. So that is a really good innovation there. In terms of your bottles though, they easily fit in there. And even though there are no teeth, it really does hold it nicely into place. Fits inside the door too. We'll try our big bottle inside the door. Yep, fits as well. There is also a little storage nook here just next to the driver's knee for coins and keys and little odds and ends. Other storage, you've got center console here, nice and deep there. You have a glove box here that is mainly consumed by the enormous manual, but you do have the second glove box up the top there for storing bits and pieces. You've got this little slot here above the top, and then you also have a sunglasses holder. There are stacks of storage options around the cabin here. Moving on to comfort, you have dual zone automatic climate control. You've got seat heating for the front row, which is good. The seats themselves, so this has changed the design of the seat, uh, so that was part of the update that's made. Seats in these are really comfortable as well, so if you are doing long distance drives, the seats really hug you in quite nicely. Uh, driver's seat is electrically adjustable, so you can go forwards and backwards. Backrest can go forwards, backwards. You can lift the front, you can lift the back. You also have lumbar adjustment too, which is good news. Passenger seat is manually adjustable. On the steering front, you have tilts and reach adjustment. And on our reach test, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving. Now, before we hop into the back to look at room, love this setup. So it's like a 60-40 upfolding type arrangement. So you can lift this side and you have a little storage area under here. It's even carpeted, it's pretty good. You can then also lift the passenger side as well. And you've got a similar storage space under there, which is cool. If you do drop the back of this, you find a jack over there. Hello, Jack. And then you also have two top tether points as well. So really good setup there. Big grab handle to hop on in. Now, in terms of room back here, it's actually pretty good. So knee room's great. Toe room is a tiny bit cramped, but it's not too bad. Headroom is pretty good as well. Other creature comforts, you have a set of map pockets, little hook here for you know, takeaway or whatever you're going to eat with the kids at night time. You've got a USB port over here, another 2.1 amp socket as well for faster charging. Air vents, you've got a centre armrest here with two cup holders. So bottle goes in there easily. Bottle can also fit inside the door without any dramas at all. You have two isofix points to join those two top tether points. And what about our window test? Here it goes. So it's manual up and down. Boom, goes all the way down. Nice job, Isuzu. We've just hit the road in the D-Max. So, under the bonnet here, you have a three-litre turbocharged four-cylinder diesel engine. Makes 140 kilowatts of power and 450 newton metres of torque. And that's all mated to a six-speed torque converter automatic transmission. Look, if you do compare this engine to other engines in the segment, it is quite noisy in comparison. So you do tend to notice it now when you're stationary and also when you get up the throttle, it does make a fair bit of a racket. So they could probably do with a little bit more sound deadening here inside the cabin. But in saying that, when you do step on it, gives you a nice little push in the back. It's quite a sort of confidence inspiring engine and that's why this is one of the better choices for towing it. It really does feel under stress most of the time. And when you do want to get up and move, it really sort of punches you in the back and gets on with things. So uh, they don't sport that uh, 500 newton meter torque figure like a lot of competitors do in this segment at the moment. But for the most part, it is achieving the same things, uh, but just with slightly less. Let's talk fuel economy. So Isuzu claims eight litres per 100 k's. We're currently sitting on 8.7, which I think is pretty good. This is a really efficient engine. We've done a lot of testing with this in the past and 
This is actually featured in an upcoming mega ute test as well that we're doing. So if that is live, there will be links to that in the description below. Uh, but we did a range of testing here and this actually came out as one of the most efficient dual cab utes in the segment. So pretty impressive there. One of the other things I like about it as well is the steering feel. It is pretty light compared to a lot of other utes in the segment, but you kind of want that. It doesn't need to be as heavy or as sort of gruff as the, the Hilux steering is. This actually has enough feel to it, but it is light enough to maneuver in and around the city. In addition to that, I do also like that they're listening to customers. So uh, they've added that feature with the trailer connect that switches off some of the safety features, but you also can now push and hold the steering wheel button here and it will then turn off your lane support system. Previously, you had to go into the settings, come to a stop, fiddle around with this infotainment screen ahead of the driver here to actually get all of that stuff set up. Now it's just one easy click of that button. What's your ride like? Um, look, it is, is ute, which means it's leaf sprung. It needs a bit of weight in the back to feel settled, but it is pretty soft. Uh, it doesn't sort of jiggle around too much, but you do feel that sort of ute element to it. And in and around the city, it means that if you do hit speed humps and stuff, that it has a bit of rebound to it. See what it's like here on our sine waves. Typically, utes don't fare all that well here at 130 on the sine waves. So, see what the D-Max feels like here. 130 being the max speed in Australia. There's 130 there. Actually, really doesn't feel that bad. That's, that's quite surprising. When we did that in Hilux, it literally left the ground. Um, this actually has a decent amount of body control there at the top end, so pretty impressed there on the sine waves. Now, there are no drive modes, no sport mode, but let's give it a little punt around our track here. See what it feels like. Yeah, fair bit of body roll there. Get on the throttle, gee, the gearbox is very slow to respond there. Traction control biting a fair bit as well. It's got an open diff at the rear end there, so you're not really ever going to be in a spot where you have a decent amount of traction. And it is only two-wheel drive high range for driving on sealed surfaces. Yeah, you do notice there when the speed picks up, there is a fair bit of wind noise coming over the mirrors, but it is very windy today, so that's not surprising. Yeah, look, it's, it's a dual cap ute. It doesn't really feel overly sporty. In fact, it doesn't feel anywhere near as sporty as the Hilux Rogue that we tested recently, where they sort of went to the effort of changing suspension geometry to give it a better on-road feel. This still feels more traditional ute in that sense. And the gearbox definitely needs a sport mode, I think, because, yeah, it, it's kind of very slow to react when you go for for full throttle there. So let's see what it's like on our back straight here. Yeah, look, it is picking up speed okay there. Um, yeah, look, it just feels like a ute. Nothing's that are too crazy here. Let's talk zero to 100. So there is no official zero to 100 time, but we've got our V-Box set up. We'll do zero to 100 and also to 120 as well to see what our overtaking time is like. Is still a tiny bit damp out there, so I might switch traction control off. There it is. Dial up some revs and we'll see how we go. It hooks up alright. Okay, here we go. We're almost at a hundred. There's a hundred ourselves to 120 and I'll jump on the anchors. All right, there's 120 there. Whoa, nearly. Okay, so zero to 100 in 10.1 seconds and 80 to 120 in 8.2 seconds. So yeah, you can see there the overtaking pace isn't amazing, but it is the same for most dual cab utes, four cylinder ones in this segment. And 10.1 seconds is where I'd sort of expect it to be anyway for our zero to 100 run. Okay, reverse speed test time. Let's see how we go. Gonna put a wheel slip there. And just under 50 kilometers an hour. So it's time to test some of our autonomous systems. So I'm gonna get this up to 70 k's an hour. 
set the cruise. So this has not only a lane keeping assistant, but also a lane centering assistant. So I'm gonna engage that, you push that button, it goes green when that's all active. And this is designed to keep the car within its lane. And you can see there, it's really already not doing a good job. So we're testing it on the three outer lanes here and it's designed to basically pulse the steering to get the car back into the center of the lane. And the reason we use the three lanes here is it really tests the car's ability to, yeah, this is really not a very good system, tests the car's ability to hold the vehicle in the lane uh, when more steering torque is required. So as we get to that outer banked lane, kind of really makes the car work for it. And you can see here that even on a very slight turn, it is hugging that line way too closely. And if I was next to a truck here, I would want to take over from that. So, um, all right, we'll jump over to the next lane. See what it's like over here with a bit more requirement for the car to chip in. There we go. So I'm gonna just lightly let go of the wheel, see what it does. We've crossed that line there completely. So that's a fail there for the second lane. Jump over to the third lane now as well and see how it performs up here. That's detected the lines, wait for the steering to go green. It doesn't look like it's going to... There we go, steering is green. No, that's cancelled. Yeah, okay. No, it's there. green. No, it's cancelled. Yeah, look, it's not a very good system. Even in the most basic lane here that you would experience on a freeway in Australia, it can't even sit itself in the centre of the lane. So that system needs a little bit of work, I think. Now, what's your road noise like? Typical, you, you do get a bit of tyre noise that comes into the cabin, wind noise as well over the wing mirrors, but it is actually surprisingly quiet. When the engine isn't, you know, making a racket, it stays pretty quiet inside the cabin, and um, I do quite like that. There's no sort of intrusive noises that are uh, making, you, uh, making you hate that you bought a unit at highway speeds. So let's talk visibility. I can see clearly down the front of the car there, wing mirrors are huge as well with that blind spot monitor built into them. Visibility out the back is good as well, so no dramas there. Uh, it is a shame there's no front parking sensors or 360 camera, because it does make parking in the city a little bit tricky. Okay, it is time to do a little bit of light off-roading. Let me run you through the specs first, so you can get your head around it all. 240 millimeters of ground clearance, You've got a 30.5 degree approach angle, which is the angle of the face you can approach before you hit the front of the car, and then a departure angle of just under 20 degrees, which is the same, but in reverse. And keep in mind as well that if you do have a tow bar, it's always going to be slightly less because that sticks out a little bit further. In terms of your four-wheel drive hardware, you have two-wheel drive high range, four-wheel drive high range, which is only front sealed surfaces, four-wheel drive low range, you have a hill descent control, a rear diff lock, keep in mind rear diff lock only works in four wheel drive low range, unfortunately. And then in addition to that, we have an 800 millimeter weighting diff. If you do want to get a better understanding of what all this stuff means and when you need to use it, have a look at our four wheel drive controls explain video by clicking up there. So uh, what we're gonna do first is go through our offset mogul in two wheel drive high range with traction control on. Whole point of this is just to see how well the traction control system works when there is limited traction and how it deals with that scenario. So we're right in a position there where the driver's side rear wheel is off the ground. I'm gonna just lightly apply throttle and we'll see if the traction control does anything. It's basically just spinning the wheels there. I'm now flat to the board nothing is happening at all. Okay, so we'll switch traction control off. I'm just gonna push this button here. You can see there it comes up saying traction control off. There we go. Now it's, now it's definitely not going anywhere. Okay, um, so yeah, that is pretty disappointing. Um, I was worried we were gonna be stuck there and I wouldn't be able to get off this. Um, yeah, so it is pretty disappointing because you know, it is slightly wet there, but the, the whole point of the traction control system is to stop the wheel spinning and to send torque to the other side that has plenty of traction. And it clearly did none of that. So um, we're gonna go around to the other side now. And this time around, we're gonna use four wheel drive high range going in the opposite direction. So you engage that by switching that over to four wheel drive high. And then once that is active, that light goes solid like it is now. We're now sending 50% of torque to the front axle 50% of torque to the rear axle. 
And we're going to go over our Mogul again in this direction, just to see how it goes with two wheels that have limited traction, which is going to be the front left and the rear right. And we'll see if it can sort itself out. Let's lean into that right about there. Okay, so let's see how well traction control deals with this. Uh, same story again, we're getting nowhere fast, so I'm just going to gradually apply more and more throttle. There we go, I can feel it slightly lifting. More throttle. Oh, we're so close, we are so close. Nothing is happening there, so what we'll do is switch traction control off. I'm just going to lay into this a little harder now. Steering lock. There it is. Finally. Okay, so we got there in the end, but yeah, it is just, yeah, not a very impressive four-wheel drive system. I think the fact that you can't use diff lock without it being in low range kind of just prohibits you from doing very basic stuff like that that you would be able to do in most other dual cab utes just with traction control on. So um, yeah, probably something I think that they need to work on. Okay, next up is our hill. So I'm gonna pop this into low range. So you gotta slot that over to neutral, switch that over to 4L, does a bit of a click, comes up there. I'm also gonna lock the rear diff as well to get up here. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna go up once just sort of normally and then I'll come back again and come to a stop and then try and accelerate up as well. So for that to lock, there we go, all right, here we go. Keeping in mind this is on highway terrain, so I don't know how well it's going to do getting up here, but we'll see how we go. Yeah, it's actually doing a nice job. A little slip there, but look at that. Very impressive. So there with the diff locked in four-wheel drive low range, it really climbed up there without too many dramas at all. We'll power through our little mud bog here. Okay, so let's test hill descent control. I've switched the rear diff lock off. I'm going to push that on. There it is there. That is now active. Drive over our descent here, see what it feels like. As we lose our walkie-talkie. Yeah, it feels fine. Sort of nothing too special there. You could hear it activating as we went down. You get the effects of, uh, I guess, engine braking and full drive low range anyway. So, yeah, nothing too crazy. All right, another mud bog here. Let's get through this. Oh, that one's nice and deep. Okay, hill take two. Uh, this time what we're going to do is I'll come to a stop about halfway up and we'll see how it goes with resumption of traction. So we'll come to a stop there. I'll just roll onto the throttle now. Yeah, that is really good. Oh, it's a little sketchy there, but we'll stay in that. Yeah, nice. I got there in the end. Very nice. Yeah, so I didn't love coming to a stop there with that sort of soggy terrain, but once it sort of figured itself out, it just started climbing on its own, which is pretty good. So uh, very happy with that. Let us continue on now. Okay, time for rocks. Let's see how this feels over our rocky section. 240 mil of ground clearance is, is a fair bit, so it should be okay through here without any big bashes or crashes. And I've left it in low range as well, so I can ride the brake with the throttle. This is really quite comfortable. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Some utes here will throw you around a lot, whereas as we saw in the on-road section, this actually just feels, yeah, it's really well thought out. It might not be the best handling ute out there, but for this type of stuff, uh, with the exception of that traction control system, it's really nicely resolved and very comfortable. So yeah, good job, Isuzu. Okay, time for our water crossing. It has been very wet here, so um, let's see how we go. Uh, 800 mil weighting depth is is a really decent amount, and I think we're at about 700 mil at the moment for our water crossing, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, now, keep in mind as well, if you are doing water crossing in D-Max, you need to be in low range because uh, the forward collision sensors can sometimes think that the water is actually a solid obstacle, so you don't want to be in a position where it then stops all of a sudden. Oh, it seriously sounds like we're floating through here. That's awesome. So, did a great job there. And then we've got our steep climb out of here on the concrete. Yeah, nice. 
here's a cake. Very good, okay, so D-Max off-road. Really good, but just totally let down by the traction control system. I just don't understand how it's so bad given Isuzu makes two cars and both of them are off-road capable and both of them have this same traction control system. So there's probably a little bit of work that needs to be done on that and would love to see the ability to use rear diff lock in two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive as well, similar to the Ford Ranger. So Isuzu D-Max, look, it is still a really competent dual cab ute. I like the engine, it's quite robust. The ride is really good for a, a dual cab ute in this segment. It doesn't feel too utey. It actually has a bit of comfort to it, especially when you do some of that light off-roading. But it is let down by uh, the traction control system off-road. I really don't think that's very good. And ultimately, I think it is going to get left behind by some of the other utes in the segment as they start throwing tech at them. This will start feeling aged pretty quickly. So I'm hoping Isuzu is working on a, a plan to bring this into the modern tech age so it can compete with things like the Ranger as well. So let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Are you a D-Max fan? Have you bought one? What's it like to live with? Is it reliable? Like everyone says they are, let me know down there in the comments section. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, take it easy.